over, man. I swear to God, I took a shower. All right, guys, this is season three of The True Presbyterian, and this is episode seven. My guest today is Mr. Matt Hamilton. This is a unique moment because Matt is here in my study with me. We don't usually have guests here in the uh, the big fancy podcast studio uh, where I don't have a microphone stand. I've got uh, Joel Beakey's Heidelberg Catechism Sermons for that. So Matt's with us. He is a entrepreneur, a business owner. He's a husband to Miss Christie. He's the father of three girls. And for our purposes today, he's a deacon at Wayside Presbyterian Church in Signal Mountain, Tennessee. That's my church. Uh, I know Matt very well. He's a good friend. In fact, I think Matt was the first friend we made at uh, Wayside Presbyterian. And so it's sad that we're going to be leaving them. But uh, it is, though, uh, sad as that may be, a real joy to get to have him on the show. So, Matt. Welcome to the show, bro. Thank you. It's good to be here. So Matt doesn't mean that when he says that it's good to be here. I don't know how thrilled Matt really is about this, but uh, I sucked him in and I promised him that if this went too haywire, I'd ditch it. So no worries. All right. Good. All right. So here's what we're doing. We're, we're still talking about, you know, the need to fight for the future. And so when it comes to fighting for the future, a piece of that is fighting for your community, right? So think local, uh, the way that, what the, the liberals mean there, you know, they say, think locally, act globally, right? Which typically they mean think locally and live like the devil. Um, for our purposes, we want to think about the local community. And if we're going to do that, then the diaconate comes into play, right? So it kind of has a significant role to play. And so I want to start there. So, so what's a deacon and why is the office of deacon important to the church? And why is it important to the larger community? So I guess I would start by saying that um, my understanding is that a deacon is uh, an officer in the church whose primary uh, mission is to serve the, the, the material needs of the congregation. Uh, that means a lot of different things. Uh, I also think another part of the uh, deacon's role is serving the elders and that he is um, protecting them from the temptation to be drawn to those material needs so that they could be focused on the ministry of the word and the prayer. Yeah. 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 And that relate. And then that then, um, bleeds down into caring for the community in that, uh, as we work together to equip as they, they're, they're equipping the believers mm -hmm. and we're ministering to their material needs so that there's no, uh, thing distracting them from, using their spiritual gifts to serve others that benefits the broader community because every Christian uh, in the church should be equipped, prepared and, and able to serve to the needs of the people in their community, whether it be people in their neighborhood or uh, people at work. Right. Um, sure. But it, uh, when I think about the community, uh, one of the things I think about is the, uh, what was the word I just used a minute ago? The uh, uh, moral proximity. Moral, yeah. Moral proximity. So, I mean, I definitely think the deacon's first responsibility is to the people in the church. Right, sure. And then that bleeds out then into the community immediately around the church and then right, to sure. the individual's community as they go out and live their lives in the world. Right, and for the folks who are listening, we are going to talk a little bit more about how this motion goes from church into broader community. Uh, but I I think that, that Matt's kind of hit on something that's really good there. So what we're doing with you know the, the offices that we have where you have the office of elder and you have the office of deacon, we're trying to meet the people's needs from two angles. So obviously the people have spiritual needs, which is something that you and I absolutely recognize. People need the gospel and they need to hear the word opened, but we can't overlook the physical part, right? So people have physical needs that need to be met. And there are people in the community that struggle with that. So then biblically speaking, you know, what is it that, that is the diaconate's purpose? Well, so when I think about the deacon's purpose, my purpose as a deacon, um, I think, so I read uh, Cornelius Van Dam's book, The Deacon. Mm, okay. And uh, one of the things I really appreciated about his book was that when he takes it back to the Old Testament, he paints this picture of the Israelites mm. uh, in Egypt and, you know, God telling Moses, tell Pharaoh that my people, you know, let them go so they can be free to worship me. Right. Sure. We're going to be, I want my people free to worship, free to worship, free to worship. Pharaoh doesn't give in. God crushes Pharaoh. He, <laughs> right. <laughs> he, he, he frees his people to worship him. Right. Uh, and then when they're, um, I can't remember if it's in there in the promised land or if they're in the wilderness, when they get 
out of Egypt and they're uh, given the law, you know, one of the things God demands is that there be no slavery between them because he wants his people to be free to worship him. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about uh, God's people's responsibility to ensure one another's freedom to worship him and apply that now to our context. And one of the deacon's main responsibilities is to uh, alleviate a person's material needs so that there is no burdening thing that is prohibiting them from worshiping God and using their gifts to serve others. So oh, that's any, good. A, anything that would stand in the way of someone's service uh, in that regard would be something that the deacon should be looking into, whether it be sickness, uh, financial difficulty in a family. Mm. Um, maybe a guy is not uh, having trouble with money, but he's lost his job and it's coming and he's really burdened by that. Just any, anything that right. might burden someone. To, right. Uh, causing to be distracted from worshiping God and serving others. Gotcha. And so there's a, there's a theme that's kind of started to appear here in the answers or what you're hearing a lot of is service and servant. And that does actually go directly to the definition of deacon, right? Our, our Greek term there is diakonos. It means servant. And so the, the deacon's role, the deacon's purpose is to serve the church right? Uh, and to alleviate burdens where they're able to. So obviously, I'm sorry, you were about well, to say something. I was just yeah, saying, no. I was going to say one of the things that I didn't say, but that also. Uh, Hang on a second. Of course, my phone is ringing right now. Hey, baby, what's going on? Trisha, are you there? Yeah. So I'm sitting upstairs uh, with Matt uh, Hamilton right next to me, and we're recording a podcast episode. So can I call you back, sweetie? All right. I love you. All right. Bye. Okay, so we're leaving that in because uh, that was fun. Um, <laughs> so you were saying. Yeah, so um, also that uh, applies to taking care of those administrative things within the church. Okay. Uh, that would um, apply to, one, just caring for the church grounds, making sure. Ah, oh, man, I'm losing my hands. No, no, no. So you've got char- care- so caring for the church grounds, so being concerned about the physical plant you might say of the church. So that's one act of service there when it comes for, you know, being a servant in that regard. Yeah. And really what that boils down to is um, serving the elders. One of the things I appreciated from John Stott's commentary on acts was he talks about Satan's threefold attack on the church. Okay. Uh, the first attack was persecution, right? Mm-hmm. They're getting, you know, their, their lives are being threatened. They're being, thrown in jail, threatening, uh, all kinds of physical threats. Right, sure. The, the next attack he talks about is uh, corruption with Ananias and Sapphira. Sapphira. Right, and okay. The third attack is distraction. So the widows come and they file a complaint with the elders. The elders are distracted from ministry of the word and prayer. Wow. And they say it is not right for us to be burdened with this. You know, we, our job is to be focused on ministry of the word and the prayer. And this is where the deacons come in, right? Right. And so we're 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 defending the church against one of Satan's attacks in a sense, which is the distraction of the elders and taking care of the administrative needs of the church. Uh, is one of the ways in which we do that, dealing with things that don't necessarily directly pertain to uh, ministry of the word and prayer. Although the elders, you know, get involved in a lot of that stuff, um, for the most part, anything that we can take care of that alleviates that burden is another way in which we're ministering uh, to the people. That's good stuff. <laughs> I had not read Stott on Acts, yeah. so now I'm going to have to go read that. So not just everybody uh, has what it, takes, they don't have the chops, so to speak, we might say, to be a deacon. And that's because there are biblical qualifications for that office. And for folks who are listening, you'll find those qualifications in First Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 through verse 13. And so I know when when I was looking at my own calling and when I was in seminary, you know, I'd go to the the various texts of scripture that speak about the qualifications for elder. And those were never easy for me to read. Uh, because I think everybody is aware of their own failings and their own struggles and, the, and that sort of thing. So I'm just going to walk through the uh, the qualifications that we have here in 1 Timothy 3 for deacons. And then we're going to talk about those a little bit. So this is 1 Timothy 3, beginning of verse 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first 
then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And so I, I, uh, I read the, the text related to elders and, and I'm challenged by it. And so as you hear that or you read that text, so what is it in there that you read that you say, oh man, that's, that's challenging? Well, I mean, it's all pretty challenging. It seems like the overall gist of the passage has to do with um, uh, living in a way that is very balanced, uh, living in a way that is not given to um, giving in to, um, uh, that's the word I'm looking for, just pleasure seeking, um, the, uh, um, you know, being double tongued, you know, it, it is so hard not to get involved in conversations where it seems like you end up talking about people. Oh yeah. And, yeah. And, unquestionably. And to not gossip, which, uh, can be difficult keeping conversations pure and not, you know, everybody wants to tell the funny joke. Everybody wants to have the the crazy story and just really guarding. Your, yeah. Your tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, for oh, me, that one's tough for me being addicted to much wine is not a big deal, but um, maybe for me, it's uh, eating too much food. But so when I think of too much wine, Word. I think just any kind of gluttony, is there anything that I'm just given to allow myself to um, uh, partake too much of uh, being in business for myself? constantly trying to consider is the pro is the thing that i'm selling today something that i would be uh proud to buy myself am i selling only those things which i think would be worthy of spending my own money on and so mm. you know what is dishonest gain and so just making sure that i'm always forthright and uh selling those things which are uh where there's value uh, not taking advantage of people and it also applies to how i treat my employees i mean this balance of I've got to make money. I've got to uh, have really good guys, and uh, they need to have, mm. they, they need to have a good life. And so, right, just sure. not, not not abusing them and, and paying them what they're worth. Um, you know, holding to the faith with a clear conscience. I think that's a pretty because the deacons have been tested. That one should be pretty well right taken care of. Right. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Um, this direction over the microphone because I'm I'm watching my VU meter down here and we're missing some stuff, uh, so it's okay I can I can crank it up in post production but I want to make sure that that's not hard to do. <laughs> so all right, so we're talking about testing, um, and so you know obviously First Timothy three ten commands that that deacons be tested first and so that there be some sort of examination of their lives. So we've got that in chapter three verse eight and ten through thirteen and then their doctrine which is verse nine. And so this is something that I know we do at Wayside. So, but I don't know what that looks like for you guys. So in, in your experience becoming a deacon at Wayside, what did it look like to be tested for you? So, you know, I met with Brian regularly. He gave me books to read. Uh, and we talked about those books, uh, as I read through them. Um, I'll take one thing in particular. It's interesting. I think for me, with regards to the, that process is that um, I came to Wayside from ultimately a Lutheran church. Okay. And so I had a real problem with the, the doctrines of election and predestination. And um, I had determined in my mind that I wanted to be a deacon and that I was willing to support those doctrines, even though I was unclear, unsure, and not comfortable with those doctrines. Okay. And so okay. it's interesting that I was reading through, uh, the uh, manual for officer training and thinking, mm. thinking through, uh, the doctrine of election. Uh, I was meditating on, um, um, total depravity and, uh, okay. So I'm thinking, okay. and so I'm thinking to myself back to first Timothy three, eight, you know, for the most part, I'm none of those things, right? I failed right, all those right, things. Right. If I had to answer the question, you know, Am I guilty of any of that? I'm guilty of all of it, right? And yeah. So, and so I'm thinking to myself, here I am a Christian. Um, uh, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. 
I know what the word says. I know that I'm a sinner. I've repented of my sin. I believe that Jesus is, is God. He died. He rose from the dead. You know, I know all this stuff. And every day I still choose myself. Mm -hmm. I don't choose Jesus every day. And I'm thinking to myself, if I don't choose Jesus every day as a saved person, there's no way I could have chosen him as an unsaved person. Right. And immediately, yep. immediately the, the doctrine or the, uh, yeah, talking the doctrine of total depravity has made perfect sense. And as soon as it did, the rest of it was just this logical progression that fell right. in place. Yep. And yep. so immediately my eyes were open to that. And now that I have come to that conclusion by God's grace, uh, I see it everywhere in scripture. And so yeah. for me, it yeah. really cleaned up some stuff that was in, that is important uh, to me, one representing the Presbyterian church well, uh, uh, being honest with the elders in terms of what I believe because I was prepared to I probably wouldn't have lied to him I would have said you know I have trouble with this but I'm on board but I mean right the Lord right. the Lord really helped me uh, in that instance through the officer training uh, so yeah you know, it's good that Brian sat down with me and walked through all of this stuff in detail and then you know I was tested at the end there were a couple of things that I missed and Brian came back and walked me through those things and made sure okay. I understood those things and then meeting with the elders uh and just talking about uh my walk um, i don't have a a conversion experience i you know grew up in the church i don't remember ever not believing that jesus was the lord although things have certainly changed in the last 10 or 15 years as a result of some growth that the lord has been kind to bless me with but uh, right right the, the testing was important it was huge um, for me okay so as I see it, uh, deacons in scripture really have two responsibilities, right? They care for the needs of those inside the church first, and then they have an eye towards the needs of the community, the broader community uh, outside of the church. And so I want to start uh, just kind of talking about needs within the church, right? So what sort of needs are deacons looking for within the church specifically? Uh, so like some really concrete things that are, you know, kind of you want to have on your radar, you might say. And you've mentioned a few, like a like guy losing his job, that sort of thing. So what are some of the things that you guys are on the kind of on the lookout for? Well, we're on the lookout for people. Uh, so I'll give you a couple examples. Um, if uh, an elderly couple, for instance, uh, uh, let's just say the husband uh, has some medical issues Mm. and the uh, the wife is not sure what the their benefits are in terms of insurance policy uh, medicare etc and she needs help uh discerning you know what are they what, what benefits are they entitled to the mm. diaconate would, if, okay okay if, if they were comfortable sharing uh some of those policies with us uh there are some guys on, on our deacons board that could walk them through that help them make sure they're getting all that they're entitled to and, and help protect them in that way. Um, the, you know, the easy one is, you know, if there's a medical issue and somebody doesn't have any money, you know, the deacon step in to make sure that they're cared for. Uh, so that if, mm. somebody, if somebody's sick, if somebody's needs to go to the doctor, if somebody needs medicine and they can't afford it, we're going to, you know, we're going to jump in and take care of that. That's no problem. It gets a little trickier. Uh, well, let's stick to, to people in the church. So, um, from time to time, maybe someone has an issue with their home and they just don't have the money at the time to fix it. But if it doesn't get fixed, it's going to keep getting worse. It's clearly a problem. It's a distraction. Right. Uh, right. So like an upkeep issue. Yeah. Somebody's soffits okay. are rotting off and, and, or let's say the roof's leaking. Yeah. The roof's right, leaking. Sure. Water coming in their house. Sure. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, a new mom uh, has a baby. Dad's working a lot. Uh, Deacon's, get together with some of the women in the church and, and get the women to go help them clean the house, fix some meals. Right. Right. Uh, stuff. So that's some easy stuff that we deal with in the church. Um, outside of the church, we get phone calls regularly from people. You're good. Hang on. Okay. So picking back up, we're talking about a situation where, for example, you know, house is leaking, a new mom needs help. Dad's working a lot. So we've got some really concrete things that are there. So give me a few more. Okay. So a big one that I personally think about a lot is Christian education. Oh, okay. So okay. Christian education is not cheap. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, think, not by not by a long shot. <laughs> I think one of the ways in which Christian schools have failed is by allowing school to get so expensive that the average family can't afford it. I also right. think I also think one of the ways churches have failed is not all churches. I don't think our church has, but in general, the church has spent a lot of money on programs and parachurch stuff. And that money right. could have been used to support the education of children. So if we have a, we, we keep um, our eyes open to the needs of families with children who uh, desire that their children be ed- educated in a, in a Christian school and homeschool is not cheap. So no, no, it's not I- any need that, um, is related to Christian education. We are very sensitive to, uh, to getting involved. Um, and I guess with regards to homeschool, I mean, if there was a situation where a mom needed help, we're probably not going to hear about it. They're going to reach out to their friends, but if we did, right, we would certainly want to do anything we could to help because that's definitely, uh, a burden. Um, that can be tough to deal with. So here's a good one for you. I, I'd like to, I'd like to, your insight on this. I had a really, really good friend a few years ago. Uh, and, and this really, I about blew a gasket when she told me this. So young mom uh, lost her husband. Uh, he died very suddenly. When I say young mom, I mean, very young mom. Um, and she was, she had five kids. Fifth child was still in diapers when dad died. And so, I mean, it's just kind of the whole thing crumbles for her sort of at this moment. And so she's struggling to figure out, you know, how am I, like, how am I going to make ends meet? My husband's dead. Um, and, and then there's all the really practical things that go together with that, right? Because obviously this is a scenario, five kids, once they're on diapers, she's not working. Uh, so now she's got to figure out how to pay the bills. And a really concrete thing that came up for her was that she had tires on her van that were basically bald. And I remember seeing the pictures of her tires. And when I say basically bald, I mean, it looks like she took a belt sander with 20 grit sandpaper to those tires. I mean, the the tread was gone. There was like, oh no, you're down to five thirty seconds. It was, this thing's bare. Zero. Yeah. And so she went to the deacons at her church and said, I need help with this. Uh, And they said, okay, well tell us, you know, kind of how much you would need to replace those tires. And so she found a good, uh, you know, kind of middle of the road tire for her van and said, this is, this is the cost. And the deacons at this church came back to her and said, yeah, you don't need tires that nice. We can get you a set of recaps for like 300 bucks. Really? Yeah. Right. So like Christ doesn't treat us that way when we're in need. He's giving me the best. Right. So like when, so when you guys look at those sorts of needs, you're not just looking to kind of come in and do the bare minimum, right? I mean, so you're leaky roof. You're not just coming in and throwing a tarp on it and moving on. Right. Right. So there's, there are real logistics involved in this for you guys. So when we think of it that way, like with the logistics, what does that look like? Are you guys calling for quotes? Are you contacting companies? Like how does that work? Uh, In most instances, we would probably find out what the best tire for that person in that particular, particular situation we would have, found out what what a good tire is and uh, probably found someone who's reputable who would give a good warranty for us right. it would be more about making sure she's getting good value and, sure, and she's sure. being protected. So a good tire from a reputable company who's not the cheapest, who if you know there's an issue, they're going to stand behind it and make sure she's right, careful. Right, right, right. Man, that's, so, okay, so guys, you should, yeah, I hope you're getting a peek into what happens in the room when the deacons meet and with the things that they've got to think about because this isn't just a case of, you know, throw money at it and that solves it. This is a case of, okay, we need to reach out to companies, providers. Uh, we need to have somebody that, you know, either is a deacon themselves or somebody that the deacons can call on to say like, hey, we've got this insurance issue with somebody in the church. Can you guys look at it and help us with that? So there's there's a good bit that goes into this for you guys. Yeah, when the in our church there aren't a ton of issues, but yeah, we're fortunate that way. We are. The Lord has really blessed uh, Wayside. Um, uh, but when things do come up, yeah, we, there's a lot to think through because mm. on the one hand, we want to give the very best 
uh, right, to right. folks and, um, and at the same time um, be good stewards of the Lord's money and, yeah. and represent the church well. I mean, we're representing the church as deacons and uh, when they when they faithfully give uh, back to God what is his, uh, there's a sense in which you know, we're responsible for using their those, those funds uh, in a way that glorifies him and Right, and um, that's responsible. It's responsible. Yeah, we don't want to waste money. I mean, if we can save money, we want to save money, but we're not going to cut corners. Okay, okay. So we, we've got an idea of what that looks like for needs inside the church. So what does that look like for the broader community? What, like, how do the deacons relate in this particular way to you know, the folks that are outside, we might say, the household of faith? So whether that be you know, somebody down the street or whether that be, uh, well, in this case, wouldn't necessarily be outside the household of faith, but not necessarily the church directly, like a pro-life center. So what does that look like maybe for the folks that are outside the community? Someone that's not a member, in our case of Wayside, comes to the church and says, I need help with X. What does that look like for the deacons? Like, what do you, what do you guys do there? Well, so I'll back up just a little bit. Uh, one of the ways we find out of the needs in the community um in particular for us mm -hmm. is uh we've formed a relationship through a sister pca church with signal mountain social services okay so okay. The signal mountain social services are are vetting uh folks who have needs finding out what those needs are making sure they're qualified uh for help and uh the the sister church has a, has a home repair ministry and as needs come up, they, uh, Oh, that's cool. They, they, and, and I'll tell you the guys, uh, from that church are, are phenomenal. They're working every Saturday almost and some days during the week. And, uh, uh they put together a team, they wow. put together a materials list mm. and, uh, Wayside has not had as many volunteers. Um, but we try to assist with funds when we can. Right. That's an easy one because they're being vetted. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you've got somebody that's already there that's saying this is a legitimate need. So it's not like you're having to do investigation yourself. That's right. Okay. So what does that look like in a situation where you don't have that? So some of the situations that we have found ourselves um, in um, uh, is dealing with homeless people that will call the church and ask for money. And so mm. we have a we have a policy we don't give money away. Because, right. Sure. Uh, sure. That can be dangerous. Um, but we try to discern their needs. I mean, where are you living? Where are you staying? Uh, how did you get in the situation? I mean, the goal is to, um, again, we want people to worship Jesus and, right. and we want people to be engaged in a local body. And so, uh, one of the first things that we'll do is try to encourage people to get involved, uh, in the church. I mean, we, we, um, we don't want to enable anyone to sin. We don't want to enable anyone to uh, continue to uh, engage in those lifestyle choices that led them to that position. Right. And, and so yeah. if we're together, we can be praying for them, praying with them, mm. uh, holding them accountable. Right. Uh, so um, one way that we have um, vetted uh, folks is, is by asking them if we can get involved in their lives. If we're going to give you money, right. if, if we're going to come pay, if I'm going to come pay your power bill to keep your power on, I'd like to know that I can come by and talk to you every now and then and see how you're doing. Right. And right. And we'd love for you to come to church. We'd love to get to know you. And, and a lot of times that just ends it. Interesting. Uh, I had a lady call one time um, who said that she was out of church at the moment, was homeless and just needed money for food. And she was living in a hotel room. So Christy and I got in our car, went and got a carload of, groceries, groceries and right. went and prayed with her and talked to her and uh it was clear that she um was gaming churches i guess you could say i mean she had she'd gotcha. gone down the list and she was looking for money and um she doesn't qualify as someone who would be someone we're going to give uh we're not going to be engaged with her on long, long term but we gave her food we prayed with her we talked about jesus Right. Uh, we encouraged her to get involved in a local church and uh, called local churches to try to see if they would get involved with her. So, I mean, we're, we don't want to we don't want to leave anybody high and dry, but we're going to we're only going to engage to the degree you're going to engage with us. Otherwise, it's just enabling. It. Gotcha. OK, so what, one of the things that you guys then are looking for is kind of a reciprocal 
you might say kind of give and take is say, okay, like we're, we're going to be engaged with you. We are going to come and help, but this is a scenario, not, not where we're saying that like, okay, if we do X, you have to do Y. Right. Right. But to say, you know, okay, look, I've come the example that you gave, we came and paid your power bill. I'm not going to come by your house on Sunday morning and throw you in the trunk of the car and make you come to church. Sure. But I do want to be able to swing by your house and say, look, how are things going? Right. Are things any better? Uh, have you gotten plugged in with a church where they could help you more directly maybe than we can? And so are those the kind of things that you guys are looking at? That's part of it. Yeah. I mean, we had a guy who um, who was homeless. His uh, home had burned and he was living in a, a hotel and uh, we went and paid his hotel bill uh, pretty regularly for a few months because it was i think a weekly bill and so okay you know the more we deal dealt with that guy uh another one of the deacons was primarily dealing with that but the, the more we dealt with him the more we turned the heat up a little bit in terms of hey what are you doing we've paid you know we've paid your bill a couple times right uh, we've here's an opportunity to, to go to work we found the guy a job oh okay and, okay and, and he didn't want the job and so oh. um we paid his bill again and and try to find him another job and just we 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 want to make sure we're putting forth the majority of the effort it's when there's no reciprocation that we have to at that point say look this this is a, a situation that's going nowhere right it'd be better for this person to suffer and um kind of feel the consequences ways. yeah i mean they, yeah. yeah i mean suffering is the great greatest teacher sometimes and, yeah yeah, it is. And uh, the goal is for everyone to be restored to Christ, to be in church, worshiping him and using their gifts to serve others. So to the degree that uh, there's just no way that's going to happen. Well, let me right, say this. Right. Typically, they close the door on us. We, we, right. we, we've never closed the door on anybody. We always make sure they close the door on us by holding them accountable to those things, which they should be uh, happy to do. Okay. All right. So kind of switching gears a little bit here. So one of my convictions, and I think you and I have talked about this a little bit, is that it seems to me at least like the Presbyterian Reformed world kind of doesn't know what to do with deacons. Right. So a lot of times we tend to treat uh, the office of deacon like it's a training ground for future elders. Like, OK, go be a deacon for five or six years. And then when you've done your five or six years on the deacons, uh, you know, deacon board or whatever it may be, then we'll move you up to be an elder, which is like the the real job, right? And so in your estimation, what do you see as some of the common mistakes that Presbyterian Reformed churches make with their deacons? Well, this is the only one I've been in, so I don't have a ton of experience with right, that. Right, right, right. But I, I would say uh, it's definitely not a training ground to be an elder. I think there are two distinct offices uh, ministering to two distinct needs. Um, right. Uh, you know, right. Elders are supposed to be apt to teach. Uh, you know, when I went, when I went through the uh, deacon training, um, thinking through serving others, I mean, I just, I have this natural tendency to look uh, for other people's needs. If someone has a need, I want to fix it. And so I'm just, right. I'm just wired for that. And so, uh, it's not a training ground. It's it's a distinct set of gifts, um, mm. and the elders and deacons should be uh, certainly working together. But it, but not a training ground. Um, I think probably uh, in the reformed world. Well, I guess uh, maybe in all churches, you know, in some churches, deacons are the elders, but. I would say in sure. in the reform world where we have churches that are uh, where the offices or the offices are uh, occurring in a way that's consistent with what Scripture has called for, uh, there's a lot of gray areas. Right. And, okay. And and elders are high functioning, sharp guys uh, who are able to do a lot of stuff, and I think the greater tendency for error that I that I would say probably exists is uh, elders, uh, running across needs and just taking care of it themselves. Right. Not, okay. Not, okay. Okay. Not that that's bad, but just that, um, you know, if they're doing, uh, 
things that the deacons should be doing. That it could be a distraction from right, the sure, ministry of the word and prayer, uh, dealing with more spiritual stuff. Right. So, kind of having a clear boundary between what the elders are responsible for and what the deacons are responsible for. Yeah, you know the interesting thing about that clear boundary. I've read, I've tried to read about that. Um, and it's clear deacons minister to the material needs of the church, deal with administrative things. It's clear that elders are dealing with, with spiritual matters, ministering the word, guarding the church from false doctrines, et cetera. Um, right. But the gray area is huge. Right. Okay. So when I talk about having a clear boundary, uh, I'm, what I would say is that the deacons and the elders need to sit down and have a conversation and say, okay, this is ours, that's yours, right? And so for, so for, for uh, Johnny Smith as an elder that encounters X situation to go, okay, that's something that I should handle or to encounter a different situation and go, okay, this is something that the deacons need to take care of because we've already had that conversation, right? So we have collaboratively as two groups of people come to a conclusion of, okay, this is their responsibility, this is mine. We want to do that with biblical wisdom, but we also want to recognize that that's something that we need to be having a conversation about rather than the the elders just kind of jumping in on something that the deacons really ought to be handling. Yeah, I think that's true. I, th I think the way you protect yourself from that is that the elders and deacons should be probably meeting frequently. Okay. Um, I think, you know, one of the a cool idea would be that an elder and a deacon kind of are, are responsible for groups of people together. Mm. And, and maybe they even meet with people together and discern needs. And there are some, they're going to be, you know, if, if me and you are going around uh, meeting with people and uh, there's a need when we leave that, I'm going to have homework and you're going to have homework. Right, right, right. And it may be that because of the more sensitive nature at times of what the elder is dealing with, that the deacon's not there at every meeting or even for the whole meeting, but just that right. there is a togetherness in which we're engaged uh, fighting that battle and uh, making those discernments on a case by case basis, because there may be times where the elders should handle an entire situation by right. himself or, or a deacon should handle an entire situation by himself. Yeah. So I just think the way to get her to protect ourselves from that is to be together a lot. That's a great stinking idea. Like that's a really good idea. Um, and and uh, as far as far as like the elders and deacons meeting together regularly, uh, Dutch Reformed guys, I'm hoping that you guys are in the background like hooting and hollering and saying amen and clapping because that's what the Dutch Reformed do. So when the Dutch Reformed have a a consistory meeting, the consistory is the elders and the deacons, and then the council or the spiritual council of the church. That's just the elders. Mm -hmm. And so, dude, that's a that's a brilliant idea. It doesn't seem like there have been there's ever been a set way of doing it. As I read through uh, the various books on the diaconate, every in every era in every church, there's been right a little different way yeah. of handling it. Yeah, yeah. But the idea of elder and deacon doing a home visit together and doing that regularly, like with the the shepherd, you know, with the groups that that elder is responsible for shepherding. Mm -hmm. So like at Wayside, for the folks that are listening, one of the things that we do is we have a specific, each elder is responsible for a very specific group of families. And so I know, for example, who my specific shepherd elder is. And so it's a, it's a, that's a really good idea to be able to say, okay, uh, Aaron, right? So Aaron is, Aaron Gould is our shepherd elder to say, okay, you know, Aaron, you and I, when you go do your home visits, I'm going with you and we're going to work together on this thing. Like that's like, that's such a, that seems so obvious that I don't know why that hasn't occurred to somebody. Well, I've done it some. So, I mean, it's, it's it has happened. Okay. Uh, okay. Man, see guys, this is, this is why I wanted Matt on the show because he has a practical turn of mind that I don't have. So that's a really good idea. So pastors, if you're listening to this, Think about instituting that at your church. Take deacons with you when you go and do your house calls. So if, if there were one area that you could point to and say, deacons need to think more about their relationship to this, like what would that be? So whether that's, you know, like 
evangelism or whether that's pro-life ministry or, or whatever else that might be, where are some areas that you think, okay, deacons need to think more about this subject and about how they contribute maybe in that area? Um, I think the best way I can answer that is just to say that as I've learned about the deacon's role, the most impactful thing for me has just has been the idea that, that we're trying to alleviate uh, those things which would cause a Christian to be in bondage that would uh, prohibit or impair their ability to worship and, and use their gifts to serve others. So having a correct view of why we're doing what we're doing and then apply that to every person's circumstance. Because, I mean, there's something in everybody's life right, that's causing sure. them to uh, be distracted when they're at church when they should be worshiping. Mm. Uh, and so just trying to really, for me, understand what that looks like and then thinking of how it applies uh, to each person individually and then how can I get involved in a way that's not invasive uh, in a way that's, oh, that's a good insight in, in a way that's uh, showing concern and love. Cause I mean, I think one of the big problems, maybe I'm going down a rabbit trail here, but it's probably worth going down is that uh, a lot of what the deacons deal with, I think at times the person on the receiving end probably feels judged. Yeah. If I, if I, yeah, need, if I yeah. need money, I failed. Yep. Uh, yep. And we forget that God, you know, he's sovereign over the rich and the poor. Right. And so whatever a person's situation is, this is part of God's plan for their life. Uh, when the world sees us care for each other, uh, God is glorified. You know, our our, mm. love, our love for one another is, I think, a mystery to the, to a lost world. And so, um, uh, you know, there's a sense in which if there weren't those people who had needs, we wouldn't have the opportunity to show that love. So it's part of God's glorifying himself. Uh, through us so the person on the receiving end feeling judged how do we protect that person from that how do we make sure that they know that this isn't uh right you're not looking down on them no because i mean there but by the grace of god go i i've had situations where i've had struggles and um oh, yeah. I, i've had help so i mean same here everybody needs help um uh, i happen to have come from a great family i've got parents who've always been able to be there if i have needs and so uh, maybe I've not needed as much help as others, but it's not because of anything special with me. I'm not smarter than anybody. Uh, the Lord just has protected me from my ignorance and stupidity at times. But uh, so protecting people in that way um, and uh, and then truly ministering to the problem, not the symptom. Mm. So, so, that, so, that, so that we're really helping somebody and not just putting off an inevitable. Right. It's going to keep happening over and over again. And then, oh, that's good. And then, hopefully, you know, one of the things that I struggle with, which is clear in this interview, is I'm not very articulate. So, being able to uh, minister to someone and articulate the gospel and encourage them in the Lord uh, as I help them if I get the chance, which um, maybe that's one of the things. Okay, so here's an idea: we got the, we have this home ministry, and we're constantly in these people's homes who have major needs a lot more needs than just the repair we're making okay they've got issues again not looking down from the from a seat of judgment but there are things they need help with above and beyond their home repair right and, and um and if the goal of, of ministering to that person by fixing their home is to point them to jesus then i need to be able to articulate the gospel to them in a winsome way and uh you know in those days that I've been there, I've not done that. So maybe, maybe the deacon could focus on really understanding the gospel and being able to apply it and, and how he helps people. Because if we're not pointing people to Christ, uh, ultimately fixing their house while it's good and the Lord's common grace, you know, he, he cares for all people, even those who aren't, uh, his children. Um, sure. But you're fixing a symptom there. There's a deeper spiritual need that needs to be addressed. Yeah. None of that matters. Yeah. Yeah. And eternally, you're right. No, it doesn't. All right. So, I mean, yeah, for me, that's, I want to be able to articulate good. the gospel to people that I help so that I'm pushing them in the right direction. All right. Well, folks, we're going to wrap this one up there. I do want to encourage you though, uh, by all means, if you're a, a member of a, a local church, go find a deacon uh, this Sunday and ask them what they need help with, because I'm sure that they would be grateful for any help you can provide. So, Matt, thanks for coming on the show, brother. I know you don't think that was good, but, dude, that was freaking great. 